So the first question dealt with another periodic trend that uh, that involves Lewis structures, and that periodic trend is electronegativity. And so electronegativity is the ability of an element to pull electron density towards it. So if you imagine a tug of war, you have a, you have a large person and a small person. The large person can pull the rope uh, closer to it than the small person. The same way with electronegativity, we have elements that are very strong that can pull electrons very close to it, whereas other elements are very weak. They can't really pull electrons close to it. And for electronegativity, the general trend is, is it increases from left to right. So as we go from left to right across a period, electronegativity increases. So non-metals tend to have higher electronegativities than metals. And as we go down a group, electronegativity decreases. So the least electronegative elements are what we call electropositive, or things like cesium, francium, barium, radium, have very low electronegativities. And then the uh, ones with the highest electronegativity are in this corner right here, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. And what you should remember is that chlorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. And it has electronegativity of four. So nothing is more electronegative than fluorine. Also, your noble gases such as helium, neon, argon, krypton, they tend to don't have electronegativity. Now, some books may show xenon has some electronegativity because it's found in uh, compounds. So fluorine is the most electronegative, and then oxygen is the second most electronegative element on the periodic table. And that's why oxygen is most of the time negative two, except in the uh, rare occurrence that is bound to fluorine or bound to peroxides. But majority of the time it has a negative charge because it has, it's the second most negative element. And then rounding third is nitrogen and chlorine. So these are some of the most electronegative elements. So the closer we are to fluorine, the more electronegative or more negative the element is. So of course in this list, fluorine would be first, the most electronegative. Then as we move down, we see we cross sulfur, so it would be second. And as we're moving to the left, we cross iron, that would be third. And as we keep on moving to the left, we find strontium, and then we find cesium. So this would be the ranking from most electronegative to least. And this one should be five on six. And so that's how you can remember the trends for electronegativity. Non-metals tend to have greater electronegativity than metals. Now moving on to question two, here we're looking at based on electronegativity values, can we classify bonds as different types of ionic polar covalent and non-polar covalent? And so based on the electronegativity trends or electro electronegativity differences, we can determine if something is ionic polar covalent or non-polar covalent. So first, if we look at non-polar covalent, The difference in electronegativity is less than or equal to 0.4. And we take the absolute value. So if it's negative, you just make it positive difference. And so with nonpolar uh, bonds, electrons are shared equally between two atoms. So they're like the same strength in pulling the electrons in. And a very common nonpolar bond is CH. 
Also, any element that's bound to itself, like carbon-carbon, would also be a nonpolar bond. So this is one class of bonds. The next one is polar covalent bonds. These have an electronegativity difference greater than 0.4, but less than equal to some books say 1.9, some say 1.7. Depends on what book you look at. So as long as the electronegativity difference is between this range is a polar covalent bond. So what does that mean? That means electrons are shared unequally between two atoms. And this results in what's called a dipole moment. And so the greater the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond is. And so a dipole moment is something is a, is a it's an asymmetry in the electron density of the bond. So one side has very little electron density. It has what we call a partial positive charge. The other side is, is a little bit more electron density. It's a partial negative charge. So with polar covalent bonds, we have what are called partial charges. It's not a full ionic charge. It's just a partial charge. And then lastly, we have ionic bonds. Ionic, right? Ionic bonds, the difference in electronegativity is greater than 1.9. So here you have full ionic charges. So you have a cation and an anion. Now, when we're doing this, you may notice that some bonds that are between a metal and a non-metal are not necessarily what we consider an ionic bond. And some uh, professors in some places, they use electronegativity as a way of classifying how to name compounds. So if you have two atoms or you have a molecule or an ionic com or a compound where the electronegativity difference is between less than 1.9, then they would, or less than or equal to 1.9, they would lay, they would name it as they would a covalent compound. So that's why sometimes you might see these ionic compounds written as a covalent compound because the electronegativity difference is within that range. And some people, that's the way they name uh, compounds. So we'll take a look here. We have HCl. We look at the electronegativity difference. Uh, three minus 2.1 is 0.9. And so that means we have a dipole moment. So hydrogen is more positive, less electronegative, chlorine more negative. So we have a dipole moment this way. We have a partial positive charge on the hydrogen, a partial negative charge on the chlorine. Manganese and sulfur bond. Again, the difference in electronegativity is one. So this would be classified as a polar covalent bond. And so there would be a dipole moment between the manganese and sulfur. Now a chlorine-chlorine bond, since it's the same element, would be a nonpolar covalent bond because the difference in electronegativity is one, or excuse me, is zero. Uh, next we have a carbon-iodine bond. Here the difference in electronegativity is zero. So the carbon-iodine bond is a nonpolar. Bond. That means the electrons are shared equally between the two atoms. Next, we have a phosphorus iodine bond. So here the difference is 0.4. So this would be classified as a nonpolar covalent bond. Next, we have tellurium and oxygen. So it has a difference of 1.4. So what this tells you is that a tellurium oxygen bond is more polar than a hydrogen chlorine bond because it has a greater difference in electronegativity. And so the dipole points towards the oxygen atom. So here tellurium has a partial, and I'm using the lowercase delta, 
partial positive charge, oxygen has a partial negative charge. You have sodium and bromine. Here the electronegativity difference is 1.9, so we classify it as ionic. So this would be a positive charge, and this would be a negative charge. And then lastly, silicon and chlorine. We have a uh, difference of 1.2, so this is polar covalent. So the dipole moment would point towards the chlorine because chlorine is more electronegative than silicon. So again, the greater the electronegativity difference, the more polar the bond is, the, the stronger the bond is. Now, just to kind of, we talked about molecular geometry in the last session. So again, we're just trying to strengthen uh, classification of molecular geometry. And the most important thing is to first draw the Lewis structure. And so again, for the first one, we have IF4 minus. We can do a little shortcut here. So we look at the total number of valence electrons. And the reason we can do this shortcut is because the central atom is surrounded by halogens. So we have a total of 42, no, 36 electrons. So what we want to do is we want to determine how many Electrons will be used for the terminal atom. So we take the number of fluorine times eight, we get 32. So 36 minus 32 is four. So this tells us we will have two lone pairs on the central atom, we'll call it CA. And so this geometry would be something with four bonding pairs and two lone pairs. So if we draw the Lewis structure, we'll see that it's going to have four bonding pairs and two lone pairs. That's a total of six uh, electron pairs. So it's going to be a subset of octahedral geometry. And so this would be square planar geometry. Next, we go to PI4 minus. And again, this is a central atom uh, bound to a halogen. So we can do a shortcut to determine the number of bonding and lone pairs around the central atom. So total valence electrons, five times one, plus seven times four, and this equals 34. And so since we have four iodine, we're going to have four bonding pairs of electrons around the phosphorus. And so each iodine wants eight. So that's a total of 32 electrons. So the difference is 34 minus 32 is two. And so this tells us there's one lone pair of electrons on the central atom. So in this structure, we're going to have four bonding pairs and one lone pair around the central atom. And if we draw this Lewis structure, it would look like, like this. And this would be, since it has five electron pairs, this would be a subset of trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry. So this would be seesaw. Next, we go to IF3 to minus. Again, we have a central atom surrounded by halogens. So we can determine the total number of valence electrons. This is a total of 30. So we're going to have three bonding pairs around the iodine because we have three bonds or three fluorines. And so each fluorine wants eight electrons. So we're going to need a total of 24 electrons for each fluorine. So 30 minus 24 means we have six electrons left. So there's going to be 
three lone pairs on the central atom. So this structure is going to have three bonding pairs and three lone pairs. And so if we were to draw the Lewis structure, it would look like this. So we have three bonding pairs, three lone pairs. So now you have to look, there's six, there's a total of six electron pairs around the central atom. So this is going to be a subset of octahedral electron geometry. So this would actually be a T-shaped geometry with six electron pairs. Next we have phosphorus dichloride ion. And again, we have a central atom surrounded by halogens. So we can do a little shortcut to determine the number of bonding and lone pairs. And we get a total of 20. So since there's two, I, two chlorine atoms, it's going to have two bonding pairs around the central atom. And each chlorine wants eight electrons. That's a total of 16. So we're going to have four electrons left. So there's going to be two lone pairs around the central atom. So this structure is going to have two bonding pairs and two lone pairs around the central atom. So when we draw the Lewis structure, it would look like this. So there's a total of four electron pairs. So this is going to be a subset of tetrahedral electron geometry. And so this would actually be called a bent. So it's very important that the, the Lewis structure is drawn correctly so that we can get the correct number of bonding and lone pairs of electrons. Now we want to look at a problem involving determining which one of these species would have the largest bond angle. So in order to do this, we need to draw the Lewis structure of each one. And so here with xenon difluoride, again, xenon is surrounded by halogens. The eight times one plus two times seven, 22 electrons. So there are two halogens, so there's going to be uh, 16 electrons used for that. And we have six electrons left over. So this tells us there's going to be three lone pairs Yes, uh, yes, no, let's do it about 14, 8, 22. Yeah. Around the central atom. Yeah. And so the Lewis structure would look like this. I actually uh, drew too many electron pairs. Let me cover it up. There you go. So it has uh, two bonding pairs and three lone pairs of electrons around the central atom. What's that? And so here you'll notice that the electron geometry or the molecular geometry here is linear. So these two, these two bonding pairs of electrons are 180 degrees apart. Because it's linear geometry, that means the bonding pairs are 180 degrees apart. Next we have ASCl2 minus. We draw the Lewis structure of that. We see that it has two bonding pairs and two lone pairs. And again, these lone pairs of electrons are going to push these bonding pairs closer together. So this bond angle would be a lot less than 109. Next, we have SeO2. 
and draw its Lewis structure. And we see here that we have two bonding pairs and one lone pair. So again, this lone pair is going to push these two bonding pairs closer together. So this would be a little bit less than 120 degrees. Next we have ASF4+. plus. The Lewis structure looks like this. And so here you see we have four bonding pairs. So the bond angle here would be, since it's tetrahedral, molecular geometry would be 109.5. And then lastly, we have SCL2. Lewis structure looks like this, very similar to ASCL2 minus. So again, the lone pairs push these two bonds closer together. So the bond angle is going to be a lot less than 109.5. So the one with the largest bond angle is xenon difluoride. So you're getting into polarity. Uh, with polarity, we know we have, we talked earlier about polar and nonpolar bonds. So one way a molecule can be nonpolar is that it only contains uh, nonpolar bonds. Whereas the other way a molecule can be nonpolar is if it contains polar bonds in which the dipoles uh, cancel out. So those are the two criteria for something for a molecule to be nonpolar. So A is only made up of nonpolar bonds. B is made up of not it's made up of polar bonds in which the dipoles cancel. And a good rule of thumb is if you're looking at molecular geometry, the molecular geometries in which there's only bonding pairs of electrons around the central atom. As long as the terminal atoms are all the same, these tend to be nonpolar molecules. So again, those geometry, molecular geometries that only contain bonding pairs of electrons are usually nonpolar as long as the terminal atoms around the central atom are all the same. So that's one way you can remember, you know, a big chunk of which geometries are nonpolar. Likewise, uh, in addition to that, any geometry that's linear is nonpolar if the terminal atoms are the same. And then lastly, square planar geometry is also nonpolar. So that's kind of in a nutshell all the different types of nonpolar molecular geometries. And this is discussed more in depth in the lecture video on molecular geometry. So in order to determine if it's polar or not, we need to first to determine the Lewis structure. And from the Lewis structure, determine the molecular geometry. So again, if the molecular geometry only contains bonding pairs of electrons where the terminal atoms are all the same, this is going to be a nonpolar molecule. Or if it's linear geometry, it's also nonpolar or square plane. So when we draw IF3, you see here IF3 has three bonds and two lone pairs of electrons around the central atom. And so this molecule does not contain all bonding pairs of electrons. It's not linear. It's not square planar. So this would be a polar molecule. And so again, the dipole moments point to the fluorines, and they do not all cancel out. Likewise, you have these lone pairs of electrons, which have a little bit of, if you want to call it polarity or negativity to it, and they don't cancel out as well. So this is a polar molecule. Next, we go to Cl2. 
Cl2 is easy to identify because it's the same atom in the bond in the molecule. So this would be a, a nonpolar molecule. SCO2. Here you see we have this one lone pair of electrons. It's slightly negative. We have these oxygens, which are more electronegative than selenium, so the dipoles point towards the oxygens. And so you see if we overlap these, they don't cancel out. So SeO2, and again, notice it has one lone pair and two bonding pairs. So SeO2 is a polar molecule. Now PF5, if we look at PF5, PF5 has all bonding pairs of electrons around the central atom. So that's a good telltale sign. And also, excuse me, all the terminal atoms are fluorine. So since the, all the terminal atoms are the same and we have all bonding pairs of electrons, this is a good telltale sign for a nonpolar molecule. Next, we move to sulfur dichloride. Again, here's sulfur dichloride. We see we have two lone pairs and two bonding pairs of electrons. And you notice that the dipoles do not cancel out. And so, and since this has two bonding pairs and two lone pairs, this is a good indication that it is a polar molecule. And this is also bent geometry. So as you can imagine, anything with bent geometry is going to be polar. Next, we have carbon tetrachloride. So if we draw the Lewis structure of this. You see that the carbon has all four bonding pairs of electrons. So since they're only bonding pairs of electrons, this would be a nonpolar molecule. And again, the terminal atoms are all the same. So we have four bonding pairs of electrons around the central atom. The terminal atoms are all fluorine. This is nonpolar. Then lastly, we have CHF3, which looks like this. Now, in this case, we have four bonding pairs of electrons around the central atom. However, the atoms, the terminal atoms are not all the same. So since they're not all the same, this would be a polar molecule. And so again, geometry is a good way to identify polarity when you have terminal atoms that are the same around the central atom. And so again, those molecular geometries that contain only bonding pairs of electrons, and again, the terminal atoms are all the same, are nonpolar geometries. Additionally, any linear geometry where the terminal atoms are the same is nonpolar and square planar. Let's see. And the last question deals with uh, those types of heteroatoms that are found in organic molecules. So these are generally, you know, organic molecules contain usually carbon, hydrogen. Some of the more common heteroatoms are nitrogen and oxygen. And these elements display certain types of bonding motifs in organic molecules. And so the, whenever we talk about molecular geometries in organic molecules, the first thing you should remember is that you know, this is only going to go up to four electron pairs around the central atom. So any molecular geometry beyond four electron pairs is not going to be a geometry that's going to be observed for an organic molecule. So with that said, we can go ahead and already negate two of these answer choices, which is T-shaped and seesaw, because T-shaped and seesaw need to have five electron pairs. 
and that won't occur in an organic normal organic molecule. So with nitrogen, there are two common types of bonding motifs with nitrogen. So one is when it's bound on one side by a double bond and another side on a single bond. And this is referred to as bent geometry. So bent is one. The other type is when nitrogen has three single bonds. And this would be a trigonal pyramidal. And these are the two most common types of bonding motifs for nitrogen. Now you may say, well, what about if nitrogen had four bonds? And it does occur, but not as common as the other two. But just to show you what it would look like, when you have four bonds around nitrogen, you actually get a cation that results. So for example, if we had NH4+, plus, it would be a nitrogen with four bonds. So once you put four bonds on the nitrogen, it becomes positively charged. So most of the time, it's either going to be bent or trigonal parameter. Now remember, we said for oxygen, oxygen is generally going to be bent uh, geometry because typically it's going to have two single bonds. So oxygen is generally bent. Now with carbon, it's either going to be tetrahedral when it has four single bonds or it's going to be trigonal planar when it has two single bonds and one double bond or it's going to be linear when it has two double bonds or a triple bond and one single bond. So again, these are the common motifs for the major types of heteroatoms that you find in organic molecules. So for oxygen, it's bent geometry. Carbon with four single bonds is tetrahedral. Carbon with two single bonds and a double bond is trigonal planar. And then carbon with two double bonds or a triple bond and a single bond is linear. So whenever you're given a question involving a molecule in molecular geometry, right away you should know, hey, this is not going, if it's an organic molecule, it's not going to go beyond four electron pairs.